Riley Schwab, sorry for the pronunciation of your name, uh, to turn on his microphone and his camera. You have 20 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Hello, I'm Riley. Let me just share my screen. Take your time. Okay, so everyone can see my screen now, I hope. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank our hosts to start out, along with my fellow presenters um, and other guests who are here. My name is Riley Schwab. I received my PhD from the University of Kansas and am currently teaching art history remotely for the University of Montana. And this talk is adapted from a chapter of my dissertation. So I'll open today with a Dutch proverb, which you can hopefully see on your screen now. Darkness and night are the mothers of thought. As evidenced by this proverb, a dark night sky presents an awe-inspiring sight, including for women and men in the 17th century Northern Netherlands who lived before the invention of electric light bulbs and attendant light pollution. They resided in a relatively flat country with views largely unobscured by mountain hills, or dense woods. The hours after nightfall took on a unique tenor in which certain activities, behaviors, and experiences often or sometimes exclusively occurred. In many 17th century Dutch paintings and prints, the night plays an active and prominent role in the generation of expressive effects and interpretive significance. In this presentation, I will introduce a variety of images with nocturnal settings in which the space of the night is depicted as either a peaceful, meditative realm characterized by a closeness with God and a distance from earthly distractions or conversely as a deceitful and frightening world inhabited by demons and marked by the abandonment of reason. I'll then attempt to contextualize historically the phenomenon of viewing these artworks and suggest what they might have meant to their original viewers. First, I must provide some essential historical context surrounding Dutch pictures of the night and nocturnal spiritual practices and related beliefs. During the late 16th and early 17th century, Dutch nocturnal scenes, um, often referred to as noxious little night scenes or simply nox or nights in contemporary inventories, experienced a dramatic increase in production and popularity that continued into the 19th century. Despite the recent increase in research pertaining to the night in early modern Europe, these 17th century pictures as a group have thus far received limited scholarly attention. As urban populations grew and street lighting systems developed, European culture experienced, to quote historian Craig Kozlowski, an ongoing expansion of the legitimate social and symbolic uses of the night, or what he refers to as, quote, the process of nocturnalization. Historian A. Roger Eckert describes how, quote, nighttime in the early modern age embodied a distinct culture with its own customs and rituals. This distinct culture, newly shaped by and still evolving through the process of nocturnalization, captured the attention and imagination of Dutch society and manifested especially in the visual arts. Leonard Brommer, who you see an example of his work here, Alondra Heinrich Ter Bruggen and Rembrandt van Rijn, among others, set biblical scenes at night in order to create tranquil viewing experiences conducive to prayer and Christian reverence. Other artists, including Cornelis Saftleven and Dominicus van Vinen, depict menacing or mysterious nighttime environments with sinister subject matter. Today, I'll discuss works by these artists and others, along with a number of traditional and contemporary theological writings that reinforced both sets of cultural associations and suggest that viewers may have had diverse religious and spiritual readings of such Dutch pictures and of the nocturnal spaces described therein. A preliminary discussion of early Christian and subsequent 17th century Dutch Christian texts, worship practices and spiritual ideas will support my reading of certain night scenes discussed in greater detail shortly as devotional aids for viewers. Previous scholars have noted that despite the prevalence of Calvinist iconoclastic beliefs, some Northern Netherlandish audiences still looked to artworks for devotional purposes. 
The Roman Catholic community in Amsterdam, for example, sought comfort and instruction in devotional imagery by Gabriel Metsu, as you can see here, and other artists as they confronted outbreaks of the plague, which afflicted the city in the 1650s and 1660s. Both Catholic and Protestant books and pamphlets, which addressed the devastating effects of the plague, generally recommended prayer for the forgiveness of sins and healing. For many Catholics, such religious practices included the use of devotional images like Metsu's. Painting and prints based on narrative from the Bible still garnered great praise, even among 17th century Dutch Protestants. In 1641, the preface to the Dutch edition of Franciscus Hunius's On the Painting of the Ancients, written by Jan de Bruyne the Younger, a member of the Dutch Reformed Church, um, celebrated the pervasive powers of religious art by referencing Quintilian, the Roman rhetorician who championed art, even over rhetoric, for its ability to emotionally impact an audience. These are just several examples of how 16th century iconoclasm in the Dutch Republic did not entirely bring to an end the use of art in the service of prayer and other devotional practices, and that Protestants and Catholics alike engaged with visual culture for spiritual purposes. In particular, members of both faiths shared an entrenched understanding of the night as a special time when worshipers nurtured a closer bond with God through prayer and meditation. Almost from the birth of Christianity, nighttime prayers played an important role in the expression of piety. Early Christian authors frequently mentioned nocturnal religious meetings and worship practices, including dusk to dawn vigils, among many 16th and 17th century Catholics, as well as Protestants, the conception of the night hours after nightfall as a time for meditation persisted. The Synod of Dort, which was held in Dordrecht from 1618 to 19, established rules for worship in Dutch reformed churches. The Synod eventually concluded that, quote, since the evening prayers are in many places found to be fruitful, each church following this practice shall do what it deems most edifying. So certainly a considerable number of leading Dutch Protestants who participated in the Synod refused to abandon the nighttime traditions of their forebears. And I actually cut the section of this just talk where I was going to mention this Rembrandt um, etching you see here, dry point on vellum etching. Um, but I'll just quickly mention since I left it in the images that this is an example of a Protestant artist um, engaging with literary um, themes, literary practices of the day there are um, art historians who have written about these prints, the three crosses, um, the various states that Rembrandt etched these prints in over the course of several years, as similar to some um, Protestant poets who would write poetry which address their own personal exploration and um, thoughts about religion and spiritual practice. And that Rembrandt's reworking of these images was a similar Protestant um, spiritual practice. So let's move a bit more to look a bit more closely at some individual works of art now. Um, the hours after sundown depicted in church interior paintings, such as those by Daniel de Bleek, convey spiritual ideas closely associated with uh, some of these Christian um, religious practices I've been discussing. The tranquil meditative qualities of the night transcend the picture's genre subject and highlight the majestic structure of this church space Towering architecture bathed in a warm, heavenly glow dwarfs the tiny figures. De Bleek focused his attention on the church itself rather than the people inside in order to create a work with a calming, meditative tone appropriate for nocturnal prayer and devotional practice. In multiple ways, Hendrik Ter Bruggen's painting, The Crucifixion with the Virgin and St. John, um, engages with the long-lived religious tradition of nighttime worship and spiritual contemplation I've been talking about. This painting's nocturnal setting engages first and foremost with um, the tradition of worship and religious reflection after nightfall. Its setting conveys a subdued, contemplative tone, again befitting this type of picture's function as a devotional aid. Most likely 17th century viewers in Utrecht, um, the Catholic bishopric in the Northern Netherlands, and the city in which Ter Bruggen lived and worked would have understood this painting's dark and starry background within this devotional context. Where is the depiction of the knight in Ter Bruggen's crucifixion appears to have most closely engaged with Catholic pictorial traditions in the Catholic bishopric 
of Utrecht, the calm meditative tone of the nocturnal setting in Rembrandt's landscape with rest on a flight to Egypt from 1647 would have resonated with viewers of all Christian denominations. In Rembrandt's painting, darkness dominates the composition which evokes a peaceful mood. More than any other compositional or iconographic element here, the nighttime suggests the spiritual content and meditative tenor of this picture. Absorbed in the landscape, the holy family, the ostensible subject of the work actually occupies a small portion of the painting's composition. Only the protective glow of the fire prevents them from disappearing entirely. Rembrandt must have been captivated by the subject of the Holy Family's flight to Egypt as he produced several other depictions of this subject, including a 1627 painting set at night and eight etchings, six of, six of which are also set after dark. All of these night pictures evoke the experience of navigating through the dark at night. In doing so, they engage the viewer in the spiritual world of these nocturnal hours, which would have inspired devotional meditation in many 17th century Dutch viewers. So other artists, including, as I've mentioned, Cornelis Saft Levin and Dominicus van Vijnen, whose work you can see here, depicted a menacing or mysterious nighttime environment with sinister occult subject matter. Portrayals by Saft Levin of the night as a perilous, unnatural time include paintings of demons or monsters tormenting St. Anthony. Witchcraft scenes by Van Vinen vividly describe the infamous rituals associated with the nocturnal Sabbaths of witches. While many in the Dutch Republic regarded witchcraft and occultism with much skepticism, such pictures reinforce the fact that early modern European superstitions about the night informed Dutch art and culture despite the coexistence of Cartesian rationalism. Such imagery perpetuated a long-lived Northern European iconographic tradition, especially strong in prints, which employed a highly conventional and recognizable pictorial vocabulary. Elements commonly seen in nocturnal witchcraft scenes include women riding on the backs of flying goats, broomsticks, and other forms of night flight, nude figures, corpses, billowing cauldrons, swords, severed hands, bones, gambling accoutrements, including cards and dice, and often rural settings. So let's zoom in to talk a little more, or first I wanna talk a little bit about um, a piece of writing and some accompanying um, imagery. Like the nocturnal occult imagery, which we will return to in just a moment, some theological writings by Dutch as well as foreign authors characterize the night as a time in which reason recedes and the supernatural might prevail. Such texts may have informed occult imagery to some extent. The writings of Jacob Baum, a Lutheran mystic, for instance, juxtaposed the qualities of good and evil inherent in all things. He contrasted the virtuous light of God and the sun, which illuminates the day, with the sinful and dark night and its companion, the moon. Throughout the 17th century, presses in the Netherlands posthumously republished Baum's writings in Dutch, Latin, and German editions. Although theological writings may have also informed the association between occult, I'm sorry, additional theological writings may also have informed this association between occult subject matter and the night in Dutch imagery. In 1569 in Leiden, Henry Verbeest published um, of ghosts and spirits walking by night, strange noises and various suppositions. This publication reissued in Latin an earlier influential text concerning supernatural spirits and the night by the Swiss reform theologian Ludwig Lavater. And Lavater's writings um, repeatedly cite the shunning of God's light by the devil as evidence that the nighttime elicited the most threatening evil or deceptive influences and beings. In January of 1681, Paulus Vink of Gornigum published a Dutch edition of Lavender's text, um, which included engraved illustrations. Many of the images depict the hours after sunset as a time when unholy phenomena took place. The book's frontispiece seen here pictures nocturnal animals such as the owl, bat, consorting with unnatural entities, including skeletons, witches, and demons, as well as the snake, the preeminent purveyor of evil and sin among the animal kingdom. 
In European visual culture in general, nocturnal animals such as owls and bats had long served as the associates of evil and deceit and their presence adds to the nefarious tenor of these images. So in Cornelis Sacklevin's remarkable painting, The Vision of the Sunday Child from 1660, the nocturnal setting again establishes a context for fearsome and diabolic imagery and contributes significantly to the works, especially puzzling and unsettling tenor. The night shrouds the bizarre depicted subject matter in secrecy and enhances the cryptic shadowy nature of the scene. Looking upward, a sorcerer appears to observe a relationship between the moon drawn on the ground and the perplexing phenomenon visible in the sky, which includes a yellow moon with the same human face as that depicted on the ground. Bats, monsters, and spectral human figures fly through the sky. Like us, most 17th century Dutch viewers of Saftlevin's painting would not have understood exactly what transpired in the depicted scene. The resulting confusion would have contributed to the shadowy, secretive nature of the work, which exposed ideas and concepts to viewers they probably could not, or according to contemporary mores, should not have understood. Evidence suggests, however, that certain 17th century audiences would have been familiar with at least some of the ritualistic significance of Saftlevin's depiction. For those familiar with the concepts conveyed in Henricus Cornelius Agrippa's well-known Three Books of Occult Philosophy, or De Occulta, first printed in 1531, the occult symbolism in Saftlevin's painting would have been familiar. In 1563, Jan Veer, a Delft author, doctor, and former student of Agrippa, published his own extensive treatise on demonology. Beer's publication shows the broad reach of Agrippa's ideas, including how those engaged in occult pursuits, quote, must observe the moon opportunely directed to this, for thou shalt do nothing without the assistance of the moon. In Saftlevin's painting, the phase of the moon corresponds to that described in De Occulta, and the depicted central figure conducts himself exactly as directed by Agrippa. Van Vinen's The Witch's Sabbath by Moonlight is another example of an artist's use of a nocturnal setting with various ominous elements, including a bat to convey a mysterious and menacing tone in a depiction of the occult. This painting incorporates many iconographic conventions of earlier witchcraft scenes, including the depiction of a nocturnal setting with a prominent moon. Similar scenes by Van Vinen feature the same eerie moonlit setting. Early modern European accounts suggest that actual rituals, such as that depicted in Soft Levin and Van Vinen's paintings, were believed to almost universally take place at night. In particular, the confessions of accused practitioners of witchcraft illuminate the ways in which government and legal authorities viewed the relationship between witchcraft and the night. For example, between 1587 and 1640, in the Rhenish villages of Longwish and Kirk, 97 women and men sat trial for witchcraft. In their extracted confessions, the majority admitted to encountering the devil for the first time at night. Confessions typically came as a result of torture and thus more closely represent the beliefs of the accusers than the accused. The emphasis then placed by the authorities on the role of the knight suggests that even learned and prominent Europeans held superstitious beliefs about the menacing nature of the hours after dark, which would have played a role in their experience of viewing a painting like Van Vinen's The Witch's Sabbath by Moonlight. To briefly conclude, we've seen today that in both depictions of Christian and occult subject matter, the night often plays a crucial role in the generation of meaning and in shaping the experience of viewing. Conceptions of the night as a time for quiet reflection and religious meditation resonate with many Dutch religious pictures from the 17th century, which depict biblical subject matter sat after dark. Conversely, Culturally entrenched fears and superstitions about nocturnal monsters and witches and the devilish, devilish character of the evening hours add a frightful note to the spectatorship of even those skeptical of the existence of such creatures. The nighttime setting in all of these works functions as a powerful device 
for creating highly evocative pictures by engaging in diverse ways with two very different understandings of the night. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Riley, for your presentation. Uh, we will now proceed to the first question period of this panel. Uh, pour ce faire, je vais céder ma place à André Habib qui va animer uh, les échanges avec nos trois panélistes. Uh, simplement rappeler au niveau technique que si vous avez des questions, vous pouvez les poser de deux manières. Il y a la section Q&A si vous voulez les écrire textuellement. Il y a la fonction « Lever la main » qui permet de prendre la parole une fois qu'on vous a uh, cédé l'autorisation de votre micro. Donc, uh, André, c'est à vous. Bonjour. Euh, D'abord, je peux demander peut-être à, à Rachel et Rosanne d'ouvrir leur caméra pour qu'on puisse tous se voir. Voilà, comme ça, on sera tous. Euh, et Riley. Euh, Riley, is there, yeah, you, you, can, you can open your camera too. We're all together now. Bonjour, Katia aussi. Euh, merci. D'abord, euh, Riley, do, do you understand a bit of, a bit of French? No, unfortunately, I do not. So I okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of translate it quickly. I'll just, uh, donc, d'abord, uh, merci uh, uh, aux organisateurs de m'avoir invité. Merci aussi à ceux qui ont eu l'audace de présenter un colloque dans ces conditions parfois un peu compliquées, mais néanmoins uh, que j'ai trouvé très stimulantes uh, malgré tout. Uh, je vois que, bon, moi, j'ai plein de questions uh, uh, pour ces trois communications très stimulantes et très, très uh, intéressantes, très riches alors même qu'elle couvre des périodes historiques très éloignées, des dispositifs techniques et des médiums qui n'ont aucun lien a priori. Je trouve qu'il y avait plein de parallèles, plein de connexions à faire. Je vois qu'il y a déjà des mains levées, donc je vais évidemment, comme tout modérateur qui se respecte, je vais céder d'abord la parole à ceux qui ont la main levée et qui désirent prendre la parole et poser des questions. I'll let uh, whoever has questions to address them. Uh, either in French or English, whoever um, I can translate to Riley if there's a question that wants to be addressed in in um, in French. I see uh, Jesse. Vous pouvez décrocher votre ou quel c'est saisissant. Oui. Euh, ouais, en fait, euh, euh, merci pour toutes les présentations. C'était super. Euh, J'aurais une question plus précisément pour Rosanne. En fait, euh, ben, je pense que c'était super intéressant. Puis je, je veux dire, on pourrait parler longtemps, je pense, considérant que nos deux sujets, quand même, il y a beaucoup de liens à faire, je pense. Les deux, on a évoqué d'ailleurs l'idée de présence euh, et c'était super intéressant. Euh, là, t as, t as aussi, tu avais aussi mentionné comment euh, le rapport de projection était peut-être euh, peut-être infaisable ou vraiment beaucoup plus difficile lorsqu'on a, par exemple, la 2D ou une projection orthogonale, entre autres. Et ça m'a fait penser que ben en fait, ça m'a fait peut-être penser, demander, est-ce que c'est si clean cut, est-ce que c'est si clair la différence dans la mesure où même dans les exemples que tu avais présentés, lorsqu'on parle par exemple de la première ou la troisième personne, euh, en réalité, il y a toujours un, un procédé d'approximation qui se fait dans, parce que euh, ben, on est limité soit par l'écran ou même en VR, à ma connaissance, en ce moment, il n'y a pas encore de casque qui va prendre à la fois l'entièreté de notre vue binoculaire et périphérique en même temps à tout moment, ce qui fait qu'on a toujours l'impression de regarder dans un scaphandre. Il y a toujours une approximation qui se fait et c'est encore plus évident, je trouve, à la troisième personne où là, euh, ce n'est pas tout à fait la même vision de l'avatar qu'on a. Ce qui fait que je me demandais, est-ce qu'il y a peut-être une grande région euh, où ce que, euh, justement ces différences de point de vue pourraient avoir une influence euh, qui soit significative sur notre rapport de création de l'espace, sur notre rapport d'interprétation, de compréhension de cet espace-là que l'on crée? Alors, euh, merci, merci beaucoup pour cette question. Euh, effectivement, euh, je suis assez d'accord. Je pense que... Euh, c'est compliqué de, de dire qu'il y a des catégories euh, extrêmement définies, mais pour plutôt, euh, effectivement, plutôt parler d'un continuum, en fait, entre, même entre la première et la troisième personne. Euh, et euh, après, moi, ce que j'essayais de, de mettre en avant, c'était plutôt l'idée d'être vraiment euh, euh, avec l'avatar, quoi, de, dans le du point de vue en fait euh, du corps de l'avatar euh, bon, qui peut qui n'est pas forcément un corps humain hein, d'ailleurs hein, euh, mais euh, et, euh, et plutôt que voilà plutôt que d'avoir ce point de vue omniscient ou ce point de vue euh, extérieur 
Et je pense que c'est là euh, vraiment qu'il y a une différence. Alors, je, elle peut, pour certains jeux, je pense, être assez compliquée à, à, à trouver cette différence. Euh, euh, Peut-être des fois, elle est, on, on, il peut y avoir des jeux qui se trouvent un peu entre les deux, effectivement, et, et comment, euh, voilà, co comment, euh, comment se positionner par rapport à ça. Euh, mais effectivement, ouais, c'est une, une bonne question. Euh, donc je, te, je te remercie de, de l'avoir posée. Je ne sais pas si j'ai une réponse très claire, mais voilà. Je vous remercie. Merci. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions spontanément comme ça qui vous viennent euh, Sinon, je vais en poser une. Alors, vu qu'il y en a une qui a, posé, qui a été posée à, à Rosanne, je vais vous réserver ma question pour tantôt. Je vais poser une question rapidement à, à, à Rabrol. Que, could have played um, the rise of etching and the rise of, the rise of printmaking in this uh, development of the scene. It seems like night scenes are quite appropriate for uh, etchings. And I'm wondering if there's kind of a mediatic convergence, of, although you did show that, you know, the devotional aspect, the question of, you know, uh, ghosts and whatnot, and the devil is also uh, a major player in this, but uh, on a purely, you know, mediatic technological level is the rise of etching one of the reasons why this motif is kind of on the rise in the 17th century. Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And so I did leave that Rembrandt three crosses in, um, and I meant to take that out because I was trying to cut things for time, but that's a great example. I think if you're going to talk about etching in general, Rembrandt is the, is one of the places to go to, of course, um, especially you're talking about innovative using usage of new technology. And so I kind of, in my talk, set up a lot of 16th century and early 17th century social and historical developments, which led to kind of an increased interest in the night amongst Dutch audiences. And so that's, you know, the social historical context and the grounding And on the technical side of things, I think one of the other reasons that these images became so popular is exactly what you said. There is these new ways of making pictures that are a lot easier than um, an engraving, for instance. Is, uh, it's much more difficult to carve out that much black. And then also, I'm not sure if people are familiar maybe with the technology of mesotint. You got, is everyone familiar with mesotint? It's kind of an actually where you get a, a tool called a rocker and it's like a little rolling thing with spikes all over it and you rock the entire plate before printing. And so the entire thing is all kind of pockmarks and ready to collect ink. And so then once you do that, you can then smooth out the areas that you don't want to collect ink. And so mesotint in the later part, especially in the 1680s, became a huge technology for these night scenes and artists like Cornelis Dussart pretty much specialize in creating night scenes with mesotint because it does save so much on the labor process. And then kind of going back a little bit to answer the question, to talk a little more about Rembrandt and what I kind of left out of that. Um, there's a really great article about Rembrandt as a meditative printmaker focusing on his etching by an art historian named Margaret Deutsch Carroll. And in it, she relates the print making processes, particularly in the three crosses, um, and as well as another print called Christ Presented to the People, both of which Rembrandt went back and reworked over and over again and really changed a lot about the composition and added a lot more things and took things away and really changed kind of the you know, experience of viewing it would be radically different depending on the first state versus one of the later states. And so what Carol does is relate that to the poetry of one of Rembrandt's patrons and a friend of his, Constantine Hawkins, who's one of the great kind of um, artistic patrons of the 17th century in the Netherlands. And he's actually friends with John Donne. And so a lot of this whole, this uh, meditative poetry and a lot of the, and Deutsch, Carol con connects their poetry and the way they wrote poetry as a kind of rewriting and rewriting and working through spiritual ideas and leaving all that kind of information in the poetry so you can tell it's been reworked and rethought out is similar to the way that Rembrandt experienced or experimented spiritually with his etching process. And so I think, yeah, both to kind of sum things up, relating both to what you said about this being easier to make and this being um, something that people could produce more is very mesotent. Um, and then Rembrandt on the other side of that is really doing these kind of virtuoso technical experimentations And all of that is being propped up by the social historical context, which led to a market for these images and people becoming very interested in the night. Yeah, thank you. No, that, that, that's very, very, um, very interesting. Yeah, I had another follow-up question. I'm, I'm going to ask a question to uh, Rosanne uh, before I, I uh, um, start hassling you too much with questions. Uh, Rosanne, j'ai une question pour vous. D'abord, merci pour votre, votre communication. 
qui a réussi à parler d'espace vidéoludique sans une fois prononcer le mot immersion, ça, ça, ça fait du bien, euh, ça soulage un tout petit peu, ça change. Euh, J'ai été très sensible à votre idée, étant prof de, de cinéma, j'étais très sensible avec votre idée de, de projection, de projection de l'espace. Euh, J'aimerais peut-être vous demander, au fond, pour vous faire sortir un peu de, de ce, ce, ce sur quoi vous vous êtes focalisé, euh, on a mentionné au début que vous êtes architecte, enfin du moins vous avez une formation d'architecture. Je me suis posé la question un peu, euh, en plus par curiosité, mais pour savoir qu'est-ce que cette conception de l'espace, de euh, alors je, je vais dire un terme, je ne sais pas si vous me dites si c'est la bonne chose, mais un espace, un espace qui est performé par un geste. Euh, je ne sais pas si l'idée de performance de l'espace est, est une notion qui, parce que projection et performance, c'est quelque chose peut-être à aller chercher de ce côté-là, mais qu'est-ce que cette, cette conception de l'espace comme un espace performé par un geste change d'un point de vue architectural pour vous, sur le plan de la composition, sur le plan de la, de la construction, de l'élaboration d'espace. Est-ce que ça, ça peut donner des idées, par exemple, aux architectes de demain de penser les espaces comme des espaces euh, euh, produits par, euh, par, euh, par le geste, performés par le geste, euh, ou en tout cas, euh, si ce n'est pas le cas pour euh, l'architecture concrète pour la création d'architecture virtuelle, d'architecture, est-ce que cette conception-là peut produire justement un type d'espace ou, un, ou un, une espèce d'espace, comme dirait l'autre, euh, différent, distinct, euh, et, et qui pourrait aider justement la, la, la création euh, autant d'espaces concrets que, que d'espaces vidéoludiques Merci beaucoup pour cette question. Effectivement, c'est... Euh... Euh, c'est un peu le, le, le sujet de ma thèse, donc euh, c'est euh... <rire> je, je, je n'en suis qu'au qu début, mais euh, effectivement, euh, euh, ce que j'essaye de, de penser, c'est dans un premier temps, en tout cas, euh, comment cette image vidéoludique, et euh, je suis assez d'accord avec le terme de performance, je pense que c'est un terme qui, qui convient bien euh, à, à ce, à ce geste-là. Euh, donc, Comment donc c est, c est, cette image et le fait qu'il y ait un, un geste ou en tout cas un espace, on va dire, performé, peut modifier notre vision de, de l'espace euh, euh, quotidien, on va dire, pour ne pas dire réel et virtuel. Mais euh, euh, voilà, donc dans un premier temps, est-ce que ça nous fait voir en fait de manière différente ces espaces-là Est-ce que le rapport de notre corps est modifié euh, toutes ces choses-là et donc euh, en fait tout ce que je me, je me concentre principalement sur la notion d'expérience et d'expérience architecturale euh, donc dans un premier temps voilà est-ce que cette expérience architecturale est modifiée et euh, donc peut-être dans un second temps est-ce que cela nous fait concevoir euh, en tant qu'architecte des, des espaces de manière différente euh, mais effectivement, c'est une question assez, assez large, donc je n'ai pas malheureusement encore la réponse, même si je pense qu'effectivement, il y a quelque chose qui est modifié et cela est, est aussi à notamment à voir avec la question du jeu et du ludique. Euh, et donc après, il y a des ponts aussi à faire avec euh, la danse et le théâtre, en fait, qui ont finalement euh, déjà abordé cette question du geste ludique dans l'espace. Euh, donc euh, voilà, des, des pistes en tout cas euh, à explorer. Oui, tout à fait. Merci. <rire> non, merci à vous. Merci à vous. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions Moi, je, ça se trouve que j'en ai plein, euh, mais euh, euh, j'essaierai de... de alors, le, le défi, c'est de trouver une question qui... Euh, pourrait s'appliquer aux trois communications, même si je disais que je voyais des, des liens. Moi, j'ai peut-être une question toute bête. Bon, la, la question de la perspective a souvent été abordée à travers la question de la fenêtre. Euh, donc, j'allais peut-être vous poser une question par rapport à la, à la question de la, de la fenêtre, dont visiblement les, les, euh, les casques de réalité virtuelle euh, proposent des versions plus élevées, enfin, des grandes fenêtres, hein, des, grandes, des fenêtres panoramiques peut-être. Mais du coup, en pensant à la fenêtre, et il y a eu la communication de... Rachel sur la, la porte. Je me suis demandé d'une part si chez Balzac, la, la fenêtre joue un rôle. On sait que ça rejoue un rôle. Et en fait, je, je viens de me souvenir d'une citation, je crois que c'était Stéphane Schwindler qui parlait de ça 
et, et qui disait que dans le, dans le jeu vidéo, en fait, la perspective passe de la fenêtre à la porte. Euh, et en fait, euh, c'est assez intéressant. Euh, enfin, J'ai trouvé ça assez intéressant, euh, votre intervention, euh, Rachel, euh, sur la question de la porte, parce que la, la porte est, est un élément euh, très, très important dans le jeu vidéo. Euh, et dans, dans le jeu vidéo, il y a cette notion également de, de narration spatiale, euh, c'est-à-dire que c'est le, les déplacements du, du, du joueur dans l'espace qui vont former une narration. Et effectivement, vis-à-vis euh, -vis de cela, la porte est un élément euh, totalement euh, euh, très, 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 très crucial, quoi, très important, puisqu'il va euh, montrer donc, le passage d'une pièce à une autre, mais donc aussi l'avancement euh, de la narration. Et donc, c'est assez intéressant de voir que finalement, on, on trouvait déjà ça euh, chez Balzac. Euh, donc, euh, le jeu vidéo n'invente finalement pas grand-chose, mais ne, ne, ne se fait dans la, dans la continuité de, de, de tout cela. Voilà. Mmh, tout à fait. Oui, puis en effet, la, la, la porte, on pourrait dire beaucoup de choses, ce rôle de la porte dans, dans les jeux vidéo. La question d'ouvrir les portes, traverser les portes, c'est quand même ce, un, un motif extrêmement, extrêmement important et qu'il faut bien poser un geste souvent pour ouvrir et pour euh, traverser la porte. Talita, vous avez une question, allez-y. Oui, c'est juste un commentaire, en réalité. Euh, je vais baisser ma main. OK. Par rapport à ce que Rosanne a dit, et la question de peut-être les jeux vidéo n'avancent pas trop en relation à ce que Balzac a fait, j'ai... <rire> En réalité, j'ai trouvé très intéressant les deux présentations parce qu'elles se connectent vraiment. Et si on pense à la question du rôle du corps, du corps de, du joueur, de la joueuse, euh, comme corps vidéoludique, donc qui va créer cet espace, qui va être modifié par cet espace, la porte dans la communication de Rachel a aussi ce rôle parce que c'est le corps, le corps de la personne, de la, sa vie privée, qui assume la maison, qui est la maison, qui est la porte. Donc, euh, il y a quand même des, cre des creusements entre les deux communications par rapport à cette expérience et par rapport à la, à la phénoménologie. Donc, euh, c'est juste un commentaire. <rire> Merci. Merci à vous. Merci, Talita. Je ne sais pas si vous voulez répondre aux commentaires. Um, sinon, moi, j'avais peut-être une... I have maybe another question for uh, Riley. Um, Oh, there's, there's two questions that are unrelated. I'll just throw them to you and, and you answer the one that you feel more comfortable dealing with or, or try to answer both. Uh, one thing is that looking at all those great night um, images that your night paintings you showed us or night etchings you showed us, uh, it's significant how night imagery um, is really about where the light source comes from and what produces the light, uh, which is something that we You know, we know that there's a direction to the light, uh, generally speaking, in, in non-night paintings. But for night paintings, the question of light and hence the moonlight, um, moonlight being, you know, the main source for these things is significant. And um, it's also a time where you mentioned the beginning where the we have the beginning in the 17th century of attempts to enlighten cities. Uh, it seems, uh, you, you mentioned this at the beginning, right? So you have a, a variety of light sources all of a sudden, uh, public light sources. So it's not just like the, the, the candle, but you know, you have different lanterns and different, there was a whole development of this in the 17th century. And I'm wondering if you were able to identify, if, if that was a, a, a question that was significant to look at night paintings, which is how is the source of light, not necessarily how the light, you know, how the light bounces or how the light, how the light works, but what is the source of light? You mentioned with the moon, you, you did talk somewhat about mm -hmm. the moon, but how, how that can, can play out, that's one thing. And this leads me to my other question, which is uh, this artificial light uh, uh, and essentially lanterns. And I'm, I may be wrong, but 17th century, and I'm, I'm supposing that in, in Dutch, um, Uh, in Dutch cities, this is something that may have started maybe, although it's slightly, it's more the 18th century thing, but magic lanterns, the, the whole idea of the pre-phantasmagoria, you know, which is more of an 18th century thing, but you have really the premise for phantasmagoria and magic lantern shows, which do have this occult um, aspect, which, which require night 
to cast, you know, to, to, to cast the shadow and so on. And so there seems to be some kind of a cultural theory um, that, that, that could, you know, lead us, to, you know, uh, from, you know, uh, 17th century up through the 18th and through the 19th and up to, up to cinema, basically using night as kind of a thread. And I'm wondering how, how much of this thread um, in your own work, you're interested in kind of pursuing like, you know, night through the ages type of thing and using technology and, you know, light sources as being kind of your, your main focus, not night in general, but maybe like using, this is how, you know, light works at night uh, from the 17th century onwards. Is it something that, 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 you, that you're uh, interested in? And you could tell yeah, us Yeah, no, more. that's a great, both great questions. And so I guess I'll, while it's fresh in my mind, I'll, I'll start with a second question you said. Um, and that is something I'd really like to explore more because it is, you know, a dissertation topic and it's very um, kind of, um, you know, siloed in that sense within the 17th century. And actually, in terms of my discipline, it's pretty broad, really, because it's the whole 17th century and it's all throughout the Netherlands. It's not Rembrandt in the 1620s and his Leiden period or, you know, something like that. So it's uh, but relatively broad in that sense. But I would like to continue that on. And a lot of my research did start taking me down an avenue where I was looking into fireworks displays which become big in the 17th century, but during the 18th century, particularly in France and court culture become a big part of cult court culture there. And um, another thing relating to court culture in the 18th century is that nighttime kind of festivities and parties became highly associated with the upper classes. And there were a lot of curfews in cities and even curfew means fire cover, um, right? So it's kind of this idea that um, you have to put your fire out at night and everyone shuts down and things like that, bakeries and things like that were often allowed to keep some um, small fires going throughout the night. But really like being able to have lots of fires and lights and socializing at night was something that was associated with royalty and nobility in some cu cultures in the upper class in the Netherlands where they kind of didn't have that at that point in time. Um, so that is something I really want to kind of pursue into the 18th century. And then actually there are a lot of famous um, Dutch painters in the 19th century even who continue on these nocturnal paintings and like this tradition um, directly going back to the 17th century. And so kind of relating all these things and how the early images, and I mentioned Kurt, uh, Gussart earlier who did mezzotints, he does a lot of firework images towards the latter part of the century as well. So that's something that I think would be really interesting to carry on. Um, I use the term nocturne sometimes, which is actually a um, term that Whistler took from music. And so that's an ahistorical term. They wouldn't have said nocturne in the 17th century, but Whistler then in the uh, 19th century really reinvents the genre of these pictorial nocturnes. And it, it goes on and on and it's very interesting in terms of um, the play of light and Whistler obviously being really, really interested in light and also reviving etching traditions as well. And so etching, as you kind of pointed out earlier, I think is really part of that ongoing conversation. And so yes, now that I've kind of wrapped up the dissertation within the 17th century, I would like to kind of explore that topic further. Um, there are a few kind of other avenues within the 17th century that I still want to look into as well. Um, but that is something that eventually I would like to kind of work on into the 18th and into the 19th, perhaps even um, centuries. So definitely that. And then going back quickly to your first question about light sources, um, I think that's really interesting too. Um, so the other chapters in my dissertation, um, one of the other chapters looks at fires at night. Um, and so fire um, paintings, these typically rural village conflagrations, small imagined villages, not real places that are caught on fire. And then sometimes you'll see depictions of actual cities. Of course, 1666 London burned. There are also big fires in Amsterdam and other cities like that. So during the 17th century, large scale fires were a massive concern. One of the major things that people living in cities had to worry about all the time. Um, and so within that, I talk about van der Heiden, who actually invented the fire hose pump. Um, and he also was the person in charge of um, lighting the streets of Amsterdam. He invented these new types of lanterns with um, the configuration of glass, you know, allowed for the projection of more light and things like that. And there's a whole new system of lamp lighters and um, night watchmen and all these new jobs appeared in the 17th century as well. People would have to go out and light lamps at certain times. And when the moon was full, they would light them less often to conserve oil and things like that. So it's all very com complex and actually really interesting um, social history of that relating to fires. And that's how I got into all that. But uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't focus too much on the the kind of sources in my rotation, that is something I'd like to do. Now you mentioned it actually, it is really interesting how a lot of the occult writing focuses on the moon 
as the moon kind of being like part and parcel of these things. And so the moon is really important. It's not just the night, but that moonlight. So yeah, thank you for that. That's really interesting. Yeah, there's like a dialectic between the moon and night. I mean, yeah. being a film scholar interested in, in early cinema, moon is like this, you know, this like major character, obviously, and a lot, a lot of early, uh, you know, Méliès, but also single de, de Chaumont, early, uh, early pâté films like the moon is, uh, you know, and obviously yeah, yeah. It, it allows the night and it creates, you know, it's a continuity with the screening itself, right? The screening is the yeah. kind of darkened, darkened environment. So, um, yeah, yeah no. so you have, uh, you have at least tw 25 oh, years of work yeah. left. Yeah. I mean, if, <laughs> if you work hard, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's going to be 40. <laughs> <if> <laughs> so yeah, uh, really inter interesting stuff. Euh, je ne sais pas si on a le temps pour une dernière question. C'est Christopher qui a la, la minute. Oui, on a encore ouais. quatre minutes. Donc encore quatre, quatre minutes. Autre question. Euh, S'il y a quelqu'un qui veut poser, sinon je vais trouver quelque chose. Euh, euh, juste pour vous dire aussi, euh, Rachel, la porte dans l'histoire du cinéma, le cinéma des premiers temps, est extrêmement importante. Et puis, en fait, la porte est véritablement le, euh, dans l'évolution du langage. On la porte comme... Euh, comme vecteur narratologique, euh, elle joue un rôle absolument déterminant. Hein. On peut dire que la, la, la porte est le personnage qui assure euh, le développement d'une réflexion sur le montage, par exemple. Donc, la, la question de la continuité des espaces, euh, la continuité des, des espaces euh, que le montage permet, le montage photographique, au fond, ce que c'est, c'est mettre en liaison deux espaces. Euh, c'est la, la porte qui joue un rôle absolument central dans, dans l'histoire du cinéma depuis Porter et même avant ça. Tout comme le, le trou de la serrure. Euh, les, les, les people aesthetic, là, voir à travers la, la serrure, c'est le motif central de toute l'histoire du cinéma des premiers temps euh, euh, et qui revient beaucoup, beaucoup. C'est un aspect qui m'a beaucoup intéressé parce que la, la porte, c'est une porte. Vous avez montré bien que c'est aussi la poignée, c'est le trou de la serrure, c'est un dispositif... Euh, très complexe, quoi, et que, que, que évidemment, Balzac a, a traité sous toutes ses euh, coutures. D'autres questions, d'autres remarques euh, D'autres questions, d'autres remarques Pour le moment, je n'en vois pas. Chance. Donc, euh, il est 33, on pourrait commencer la pause dès maintenant. Donc, euh, thank you. Very générosité much. de deux minutes pour <rire> deux aller prendre minutes, air, euh... Prendre un petit café, euh, se dégourdir les yeux et les jambes. Euh, oui, exact. Donc, on va rentrer en pause jusqu'à 14h50, une petite pause de 17 minutes, et on va revenir pour les deux dernières présentations de la journée qui vont être présentées par Katia et Clara. Donc, on se revoit à 14h50. Merci à tout le monde. Merci, aux merci aux à André d'avoir. Euh, merci à André d'avoir assisté à la période de questions fort plaisir. pertinente. À tout de suite. Merci. 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 Merci.